With a career spanning 20 years, 4 comics, 1 film, a Japanese animated series and a video game, Brian Lee O'Malley is arguably one of the most influential comic creators of the last two decades. You've probably heard of his biggest work, Scott Pilgrim, but if I was to have an educated guess, you don't know much about his other comics. In the hopes of bringing much needed attention to the rest of his work, I read every comic written and or drawn by Brian Lee O'Malley. In mere moments we shall go back in time and trace Brian's two decade spanning career and all of its notable works along the way. With series as diverse as these, there's no doubt that there's something to read for everyone. Although a successful comic creator, there was some time between when Brian began his comic career and when he would work on a comic of his own. In the summer of 2001, Brian would be introduced to James Lucas Jones, an editor at Oni Press, the soon-to-be publishers of Scott Pilgrim. But before Scott Pilgrim, there was Hopeless Savages, Brian's first notable job in the comic industry. The Hopeless Savages comics are a series of comic books that follow the Hopeless Savages, a rock star family consisting of rock stars Dirk Hopeless, Nicky Savage, and their four kids, Rat Bastard, Arsenal Fierce, Twitch Strummer, and Skank Zero. Each volume of the comic series is a standalone focusing on a different family member and their history. Volume 1 follows the oldest child, Rat Bastard, who having left a life of fame behind for a regular 9 to 5, is then dragged back into the spotlight when both of his superstar parents are kidnapped and now he must rediscover his older, more violent self if he wants to have any hope of saving his parents. Unlike its predecessors, Volume 2 of Hopeless Savages is a lot more grounded. It follows the youngest Hopeless Savage, Skank Zero, and the many ups and downs that make up her first love. Her attempts to find love up until now have been complicated because all of the boys up until now have taken her name, Skank Zero, quite literally. Fortunately, she does find a boy who likes her for herself, but her attempts to pursue a relationship with him are complicated by an invasive TV crew and the fact that she's grounded. Volume 2 of Hopeless Savages, Hopeless Savages Ground Zero, is a story of teenage angst, a tale of first loves, and learning to love. All volumes of the Hopeless Savages series share a common writer in Jen Van Meter, but each individual volume differs in that they have a different artist. Hopeless Savage's Ground Zero is then notable for this video as it is primarily drawn by Brian Lee O'Malley. Despite this volume being only four issues long, years later Brian would describe this as A big wake up call and a major learning experience. Drawing comics is hard. It's really, really hard. This was the longest comic I had done to that point. I didn't get done until towards the end of the year. I was slow. They even had to get someone else to ink the third issue, both because I sucked at inking and because I was way behind schedule. In spite of all of this though, I personally think that the comic came out looking quite good. Although coming out quite early on in his career, you can still see many of the distinctive features that Brian's art would later be known for. The chippy-esque proportions, characters with disproportionately large heads and tiny limbs, the massive expression at eyes, no doubt inspired by his love of manga. All of these features present here would become more and more pronounced over the course of Brian's career until they became what we would recognise today as Brian Lee O'Malley's art. That is, excluding Snot Girl. Snot Girl looks distinctively different from the rest of these works, but more on that later. Brian's art style adds a youthful feel to the series that complements the themes of first loves. Nowhere is this better represented than Zero's character design. Her sharp teeth and deep set eye bags contrast her tiny frame and big head. Likewise, her rebellious attitude is contrasted in the story by her useful naivete around love. And I love how this is all conveyed through her design. Out of all the series I read for this video, this one surprised me the most. Although it is the first comic that I mentioned, it was the last one that I read for this video. I was unsure on whether to read it or not, and perhaps it was because I had such low expectations that I ended up really loving it. And because of that, I would heavily recommend this. This period from 2000 to 2002 was a very formative period for Brian's career, and no doubt taught him a lot of lessons. Hopeless Savages is just one of many works that Brian worked on during this time. Other notable works would include Spider-Man Doctor and Style, a short-lived webcomic following the high school life of Kim Pine, Lauren Wood and Lisa Miller, two of which would later feature in Scott Pilgrim. During this period, Brian had been trying to pitch many different comics to Oni Press, and eventually one of them was greenlit. In 2003, Brian finally started working on a comic that would be entirely his own. In December 2003, Lost at Sea was released. 
4,000 kilometers and 40 hours separate California and Canada. 18-year-old Riley finds herself hopelessly lost, struggling to navigate this expanse with three strangers. We don't know who these people are or why she's traveling with them, all we do know is that somewhere in this 4,000 kilometer expanse is Riley's soul. And the next 200 pages of this graphic novel will be spent trying to answer who these people are and most importantly, find her soul. Lost at Seas was a series I really enjoyed, mainly because it was very relatable to me. Having been on several road trips myself over the years, some with family, others with friends, I've always been a really big fan of them and long journeys in general. This started for me in school with something called the Duke of Edinburgh Expedition. For those who don't know, this is an award scheme run across the whole of the UK for school age kids. One of its components was the expedition. In my case, it involved myself and a small group of other students being driven away from the city and into the wilderness. Armed with a map and whatever we could fit in our bags with us, we would make our way to the pickup point on foot. What spoke to me the most about these road trips was the quiet. In the absence of the city noise, you're left with the quietness of your thoughts. And these trips for me were a moment for me to think and reflect. Likewise, for Raleigh, in the absence of the pressures of her daily life, the school, her mum, Stillman, this journey is a time for her to reflect on her life. Over the course of this trip, we explore Raleigh's views of herself and the perspective on her life up until now. Through her scattered thoughts, we can piece together the image of a girl, afraid, unable to connect with others and those around her, but wanting to be accepted by them nonetheless. It then comes as a surprise to find out that this same girl went 4,000 kilometers away from home to meet someone. This is why Riley came to California, but not why she's traveling with these strangers. Another thing I loved about expeditions was the absence of technology. In its absence, all you can really do is exist in nature and talk with those around you. These trips for me offered me a way to deepen bonds with the people around me. The nights especially were a great way to share your innermost thoughts. Thoughts that were not necessarily suited to the performative environment of a classroom. Whether I was already friends with someone or we were essentially strangers, I always found myself growing closer with those around me. The same can be said for Riley. Over the course of the graphic novel, we find out that these strangers that she's traveling with are her classmates. They had all went on a trip together without Riley only coincidentally picking her up on their way back home. What ensues is an uncomfortable 40 hours back home where the shy and unassuming Riley is stuck in her car with these strangers who bicker and fight. Slowly though, over the course of several days, Riley begins to open up to them, overcoming her fears of people and finding herself confiding in her classmates, sharing her traumas, her insecurities, and in the process, developing something akin to a friendship. Lost at Sea is a psychological story and one that is heavily focused on exploring the mind of its main character. At its core, it's a story about loneliness and the struggle to connect with those around you. It reminds me of anime like Tatami Galaxy and Welcome to the NHK, who similarly both focus on characters who are struggling to connect with those around them. Tatami Galaxy follows Watashi, a third year university student who wasted the first two years of his university life. He now finds himself alone in his room, resenting those around him and his inability to capture the perfect campus life. The series sees him relive the first two years of his university life, attempting to make different decisions, all in the hopes that he might not end up as miserable and alone as he is now. Welcome to the NHK follows Sato, a 22-year-old neat, unable to go outside for fear of being judged. The reason for his seclusion? A mysterious organization bent on fostering social withdrawal in people like him for the amusement of others. Over the course of the story, Sato attempts to better himself and change, but every time the NHK seemingly thwart his plans of integrating back into society. Within Rally, I see shades of both Watashi and Sato. Similarly to Watashi, Rally hyper obsesses over her life and everything that has brought her up to this point. Similarly to Sato, she blames her inability to connect with others and function in the outside world on a non-existent entity. A cat she encountered many years before. A cat that she believes to have stolen her soul. These cats first appear innocently in her dreams, but worm their way into reality as auditory illusions and then real cats. Lost at Sea reaches its climax when after several sleepless nights obsessing about her life and the cats, Riley's mind completely unravels. 
maybe because of its personal content or the fact that it was Brian's first comic, Lost at Sea was not particularly successful. It received a few reviews and comic blogs, but as far as his life was concerned, he was back to life as normal and back to work on his next book. A book that would make Brian Lee O'Malley a household name. Coming out just eight months after Lost at Sea is Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Life. Returning viewers will already know that I've done a very exhaustive video on Scott Pilgrim and all its adaptations. In an attempt to avoid repeating myself again in this video, I've limited myself to just one minute to talk about Scott Pilgrim. So here's everything you need to know about Scott Pilgrim, slacker, gamer, bass guitarist, predator. Following his breakup with indie rock darling Envy Adams, 23-year-old Scott Pilgrim finds himself dating 17-year-old Max Chow. But before we get the displeasure of seeing where such a relationship might go, Scott Pilgrim encounters the girl of his dreams. Ramona Flowers, a mysterious new girl with colourful new hair and a whole load of emotional baggage. More importantly though is the fact that she has just roller skated her way to the front of Scott's mind. One house party and a botched attempt at a date later sees her agree to be Scott's girlfriend, but on one condition. He defeats her seven evil exes. And yes, that's right, seven. We have the Indian, Captain America, the vegan one, the girl one, the two for the price of one, and the full-time asshole. And all of them have to go if Scott wants to date Ramona Flowers. Hidden behind this outlandish premise is a story on how you can unintentionally do harm. Alongside defeating his exes, Scott Pilgrim must grow as a person if he wants his relationship with Ramona to last. This is a story about growing up in your 20s and not running away from your past. I think Brian Lee O'Malley phrased it best himself. It's a shonen comic like Dragon Ball Z and Rhyme One Half, a slice of life indie rock rom com like Blue Monday and Karakan all rolled into one. And with a film, game, anime, animated short, and countless cultural references, Scott Pilgrim is Brian Lee O'Malley's biggest work. Whatever he would make after this comic would no doubt always be trying to live up to its reputation. Releasing four years after the end of Scott Pilgrim is Brian Lee O'Malley's long-awaited third comic, Seconds. Seconds asks the reader one main question. What if redoing all your past mistakes was as easy as writing them down? A few lines on a piece of paper and years of regret are gone. We follow 29-year-old Katie, the co-owner and head chef of the beloved restaurant Seconds. Although co-owning a successful restaurant, Katie's working towards opening another restaurant, one that isn't co-owned and one that's just for her. Katie is at a stage in life now where she feels like she must have everything together and so she has a lot at stake, a lot that could go wrong and a lot that will go wrong. On the surface, Katie may seem like a well put together adult, but in reality, she's anything but. Katie in a lot of ways is very similar to Scott, and like Scott, Katie is someone who unintentionally does harm to those around her. For example, in her pursuit of fun, Katie has developed a relationship with one of her employees. She's a great chef and a capable leader and the type of person that you might look up to. And in Katie's relationship with her employee, she profits off this admiration for her own benefit. The thought that this might be an abuse of her position is something that never crosses her mind. Katie also doesn't really have any friends and finds herself exclusively hanging out at the restaurant. These are just a few issues that Katie's facing at this time, and a few issues that could potentially blow up in her face. And so when Katie's given a chance to fix these issues that will arise from her poor life choices, it's an opportunity that she can't refuse. The exact means with which she achieves this is a concept known as a revision. It's the primary driver for the plot in this graphic novel and essentially it can be boiled down to this. 1. Write down your mistake. 2. Ingest a mushroom. 3. Go to sleep. And 4. Wake up anew. This power is granted to Katie by a house spirit appearing to her in her dream and essentially grants her the ability at a redo of life. When I first saw this in action, my immediate thought was, oh, like Groundhog's Day. While not exactly a time loop series, the relationship that Katie has with her revisions is not too dissimilar to Phil and the time loops in Groundhog's Day. This overlap is best seen in my favourite sequence from the film. After several loops spent indulging in lust, gluttony and theft, the allure of being stuck in the same day with no consequences is lost to Phil. Following this, he decides that he will try and seek out a genuine connection. His eyes then settle on his new producer, Rita. He takes her to dinner, but unfortunately his advances on her fail, miserable. And so Phil naturally does what any man, 
or gamer might do in this situation and save Scums his way to winning the girl. Over the course of who knows how many loops, Phil crafts the perfect date with Rita, every response and every mannerism tested in previous loops to get the best response. Outside of being manipulative, I have to respect the grind. Anyone who's ever stalked the girl's Instagram to find the perfect song to play on the first date will know exactly how Phil feels. The whole point of this sequence is to achieve the perfect date, and this hunt for perfection is also something that Katie expresses throughout seconds, and is likely the reason I made this connection between these two works in my head in the first place. Katie expresses similar behaviours to Phil over the course of seconds, from self-indulgence to abusing her revisions to benefit her relationship. Every time Katie uses a revision in a second, it is to achieve the perfect outcome, and notably to avoid any consequences. In the search for perfection, Katie abuses this power granted to her by the house spirit, speedrunning her way through revisions. These powers don't come without their own drawbacks, and Katie must face the consequence of using this mysterious power as a crutch instead of addressing the source of the issues in her life. Brian Lee O'Malley's next comic would represent a monumental shift in his career as it would be the first time that he didn't draw one of his comics. Despite his early experiences with Hopeless Savages, Brian had grown a fondness for working collaboratively during Seconds, where he worked with an assistant. As a result, when Image Comics asked him to pitch them a new series, Brian got in touch with long-term friend and illustrator Leslie Hung. With Brian writing and Leslie illustrating, the two would go on to produce Brian's fourth work, Snot Girl. With the advent of social media and the birth of the social media influencer, becoming famous has never seemed more achievable. The only thing that stands between you and a life of fame and celebrity is an internet connection. But is having millions of people obsess over every detail of your life all it's made out to be? What do you lose in the pursuit of celebrity and what is the cost of fame? Snot Girl is primarily a slice of life, following fashion blogger Lottie Person, but it also consists of a large class including, but not limited to, friends, exes, obsessive fans, crazy killer butlers and ghosts. At 15 chapters, Snot Girl is the second longest serialization by Brian, and these 15 chapters are broadly characterized into three arcs. Each arc primarily consists of Lottie's day-to-day -day as a social media influencer, lavish dresses, extravagant parties, fan meetups, brunch. But as this occurs, there's typically a secondary plot unfolding as well. For example, the mysterious disappearance of Caroline, Charlene's coma, Meg's wedding, all of these plot threads coalesce at the climax of each arc, making for what is often a very exciting end to the arc. Up until now, Brian Lee O'Malley has historically drawn inspiration for his stories from his real life, the most notable example being Scott Pilgrim. During the writing of Snot Girl though, Brian lived in LA, and Snot Girl in some ways is meant to mirror the social media influencers that he would have no doubt come across. Snot Girl is then primarily concerned with the idea of celebrity and the many pros and cons that come with this. Having achieved the status of an internet celebrity, Lottie is blessed with copious amounts of attention, but consequently, a lot of scrutiny too. Girls want to be her, boys want to be with her, but this adoration is dependent on maintaining her image. An image that at any time could come crashing down because of her allergies, leaving her a paranoid mess. This constant fear of maintaining her image in a hyper-obsessive world is a major source of conflict in the story and the primary source of Lottie's many breakdowns. Despite this though, Lottie's relationship with social media and celebrity never changes. As much as maintaining this image takes its toll on her, the attention and envy that it affords her are seemingly worth the toll. The only time this is called into question is through Lottie's relationship with Caroline. A small blogger with only a few hundred followers, Caroline is Lottie's obsession for much of Snot Girl's runs. Lottie wants to leave her friend group for Caroline. She dreams of her and seemingly also has an inferiority complex towards her. Caroline represents the opposite of Lottie. She doesn't care how people perceive her, she's effortlessly beautiful and so authentically herself. In the environment that Lottie finds herself in, you're rewarded for being inauthentic, and yet here Lottie is obsessing over someone who's authentically themselves. Despite all the fame and the glamour that comes with being a celebrity, Lottie is left insecure by her inability to truly be herself. This relationship with authenticity is what I found the most fascinating about this comic. The constant back and forth between longing for authenticity while living in an environment that rewards being inauthentic. 
Celebrities present it similarly to a drug, where once you get a taste of it, you'll do anything to maintain it. Celebrities are presented as larger-than-life figures, while in reality they are mostly insecure messes. It makes for a really interesting read, and one that stands out from the rest of Brian's works. As a collaborative effort between Brian and Leslie, Snot Girl naturally features influences from both artists. While not a fashion blogger, Brian did have a history of allergies and drew on this for inspiration. Leslie, with her love for fashion, then infused this into the story through the many outfits that characters in Snot Girl wear. It's for this same reason, though, that it took me really some time to warm up to this story. I found the world the story inhabited to be really vain and really unlikable as a result, and it wasn't until the end of the first arc that I really warmed up to Lottie and the rest of the cast. Regardless though, I still think that Snot Girl is a must read for any fan of Brandley O'Malley's previous books. Snot Girl ran from July 2016 to April 2021 before entering an indefinite hiatus, and at the time of making this video marks the last comic released by Brandley O'Malley. That leaves us with only one more question. What next? Announced all the way back in 2016, even before Snot Girl was released, Worst World will most likely be Brian's next project. In the eight years since the announcement of Worst World, though, we've learned very little about this project. What we do know is that it's going to be set in Los Angeles. It will have two protagonists, 30-something-year-old Benny, 20-something-year-old Aubrey, and that it will be part of a trilogy of graphic novels, each being well over 300 pages respectively. Now this really isn't much to go off of, but through examining the rest of Brian's career, we might just be able to make a guess of what to expect. Works such as Lost at Sea and Scott Pilgrim highlighted Brian's tendency to draw inspiration from his real life. At one end of the extreme, we have Lost at Sea, which is a heavily grounded story. On the other hand, Scott Pilgrim, a story centered around Brian's interests, just turned up 100%. One of these interests was music, and taking a look at the promotional image, we might expect this to make a return in the form of some rock influences in Worst World. Another thing we saw in Scott Pilgrim was a flawed main character. This was also present in Seconds and Snot Girl. Knowing this then, we may expect this to show up in at least one of, or both of the main characters, Benny and Aubrey. Regardless of where they both fall on the scale of flawed human beings, I'm very excited to see how their flaws will play off of each other. One thing I do think we can safely assume from all of this though, is that these two characters will play a central role in the story. This would be the first time that this has happened since Scott and Ramona, and I'm sure that their dynamic will be at least as interesting. Taking a look at the promotional image again, we can see Benny in a suit and Aubrey in front of what seems like a band. I can't help but speculate that this might be some kind of manager and talent relationship. With the location set in LA, it's possible that we see ideas around celebrity that were explored in Snot Girl creep up again in Worst World. I hope that in just a few short years we can look back on this prediction and be amazed at how right I am, or more realistically, laugh at how wrong these predictions were. Either way though, Brian Lee O'Malley is a legend of the comic world with countless amazing works under his belt. Whatever he chooses to do in the future, I will no doubt be reading, and I hope after watching this video, I've convinced at least one more person to do the same. And a special thank you to Added Cheese for the voice of Brian Lee O'Malley.